Good afternoon. Wonderful to see you all here late in the day after what has been a pretty intense set of discussions already, and we're about to have another one, and uh, glad that you're part of it. I'm Francis Collins. Uh, I'm the director of the National Institutes of Health in the United States, which means on this panel, talking about African-led health systems, I'm probably the least knowledgeable person. But I do know how to run a meeting, so maybe that's why they chose me <laughs> to do this particular role. And it's a topic that I'm intensely interested in. Earlier this afternoon, in a different room, we had a discussion about a coalition for African research and innovation, a new entity called CARI, C-A-R-I, which may very well come up in this panel, uh, which is an effort being led strongly uh, from African interests in seeing the center of gravity of research support shift from what has traditionally been support coming from outside the continent to a place where Africa takes ownership of its own research interests and begins to build that capacity, strengthens its institutions, makes it possible uh, for young scientists uh, to find exciting professional roles uh, without finding themselves lured away to other places. And so um, this is a, a part, I, uh, some of us would say rather important part, of what we're talking about, but obviously the topic is enormously broad. What can we do uh, to try to increase the strength of African-led health systems the topic is so broad that one might worry a little bit about how many takeaway messages we can generate, but we're going to do our best. And we have a very interesting and diverse group of panel members who can shed light on this from rather different perspectives. And so I'm counting on them uh, to turn this into a lively conversation and also on you because we will open this up to audience participation after a bit. <coughs> uh, but first, um, let me uh, introduce the panel uh, one by one uh, by asking each of them a question. My introductions are going to be extremely brief because you have access to bios and your material and we uh, don't have a lot of time. But um, uh, I think appropriately, uh, let me begin uh, by asking the first question uh, to the Minister of Health of South Africa, uh, Aaron Matsualedi, who has played a significant role, to put it mildly, uh, in the way in which South Africa's health systems have been shaped up, and obviously a set of systems that have been under considerable stress with HIV, AIDS, and TB, and other matters. Um, so he's in a unique position, perhaps, to start off this conversation. So, Minister, let me just ask you, looking at the circumstances right here in South Africa, uh, you must have ideas about what is the most critical set of changes or advances uh, that ought to be made uh, to have the confidence that your own African-led health system is accomplishing all that it needs to. Where, where, what are your highest priorities now? Well, at the present moment, our, our flagship program is to achieve universal health coverage, which we call NHI in South Africa, the National mm -hmm. Health Insurance. That is our uh, uh, flagship program at the moment, but we, we set further in order to achieve that NHI and to strengthen the healthcare system further. The heartbeat of the healthcare system must be primary healthcare. At the moment, we are running a hugely curative healthcare system, which is very unaffordable, which is very expensive mm. and does not guarantee results. So we want to refocus, reposition the whole healthcare system so that is based on primary healthcare which many people undermine. Many people believe primary health care means some form of second-rate care, whereas it means exactly, it, it means actually three things. It means prevention of diseases, that's number one. It means promotion of health, and number three, it means when you start your interaction with the healthcare system, you start right at the bottom, not at the top. At the moment in South Africa, healthcare system starts at the top. Mm. When people get sick, they rush to a specialist, those who don't go to the private specialist rush to the biggest uh, healthcare, I mean, the biggest hospital, the biggest teaching or, or, or tertiary hospital in mm. the country. And mm. all those things are not working very well. So we would like a primary health care. And central to that issue of primary health care, we want a game changer, a game changer in the employment of a large number of community health care workers who work in the villages, meaning you know what's happening even before people go to a clinic. You know what's happening inside the household to individuals there, 
and you know how to stop, uh, you know, to stop things from happening, be it HIV, AIDS, and TB, you'll know who have tested, who knows their status, uh, whether kids have been immunized, you also teach them. You also part, impart them, I mean, impart information to them. For instance, uh, adolescents who are now having problems of drugs and alcohol, you know, you can impart that information and pick it up at home through primary health care workers. So if, if we achieve those, mm. that means universal health coverage, which is based on primary health care, whose central tenant is primary health care workers. To me, we will have solved more than 80% of the problems that the healthcare system is faced with. Well said, and I can't help but be slightly bemused that in fact we have not solved that problem in the United States because we have the same issues about overemphasis on specialty and underemphasis on primary care and still having a debate about universal health care in a country that certainly has a lot of resources. Uh, well, let me just continue down the line here and uh, go next uh, to Ed Whiting. Uh, Ed is uh, uh, representing here, in this case, uh, a specific philanthropy, the Wellcome Trust, uh, but I can probably also speak uh, to what philanthropy in general might be able to contribute. But maybe just from your perspective, uh, Ed, uh, what are the things that you would most want to see happen uh, to bring the African-led health systems into the place where you would hope they could be? Sure. So we in the Wellcome Trust were the second biggest charitable foundation in the world by spend. We've got about £250 million of active grants in Africa. We have three uh, major overseas programs, we call them, uh, one based here in Durban. Um, we've been investing for quite some time in building up local research capacity. And we feel, I think, reflecting on some really interesting discussions today um, and that over the past couple of days, that these agendas on, on epidemics and on building local research capacity are actually interlinked and research leadership. And, and I, think, I think you can solve a lot of problems by investing into research. So we're interested to explore what's possible here and what complementary roles um, foundations like ours, governments, uh, and other players, the private sector particularly, can, can make. Um, at the Africa CDC session earlier, uh, John, John Kangasong has done great work in getting the thing up and running. 93 days old, it's only just started. We discussed the importance of linking together networks of excellent surveillance and research labs. Um, I mentioned the example that we've looked at at the Ugandan Virus Research Institute, uh, where there's a long-established long footprint looking at HIV-AIDS. Um, they then expanded to look at disease surveillance in a bit more detail and got, got really stuck into um, viral hemorrhagic fever and, and surveillance and response for viral hemorrhagic fever. Um, and I think they were, able to do, they were able to do so partly because of that strong research base. The effect of that was that the time between the confirmation of a first case in a viral hemorrhagic fever and the launch of the response which in 2007 was about two and a half months. By 2011 was about one day. And this, this lab, this, this group, the, these groups of people, this focus on how you can turn research excellence into good surveillance that then empowers a local response um, was, has been incredibly effective at dealing with outbreaks of, of viral hemorrhagic fevers very effectively and quickly. So we think there's something about local leadership um, and how local leadership can be a great way of responding to epidemic risk and how actually it's the only way to respond to epidemic risk. Um, and we think it's the, it puts the capacity in place when you need it most. It gives you much more likelihood of securing the social license to conduct trials and look at delivering therapies in the field. Um, we also think it's more sustainable and easier to, to network regionally. But to really unlock this, and directly to your question, I think there are a couple of things that we need to do. And firstly, on epidemics, I don't think we price risk very well. I don't think we fully understand the risks to countries of epidemics, and I don't think that's reflected in the incentives that are upon those countries. So with the World Bank, we've been looking at whether we can push IMF to take account of this in Article 4, um, whether we might work with rating agencies to make sure that people are saying, this is an existential risk if your country is not resilient and not prepared, and the health system is at the heart of that. Um, secondly, though, I think there's something about leadership and that shift in leadership, where we, are, we feel we're at this point through the creation of AISA, um, uh, based in Nairobi, which is all about scientific excellence and leadership. And it's, it started a couple of years ago. It's now funding, on its way to funding 557 fellows. It's got 11 consortia. Um, and it's African-led, and it's Africa setting the research priorities for that organization. Mm -hmm. So we think that there's, there's something there, there's a model we can work with. Similarly, we think Human Heredity and Health, uh, H3 Africa organization, is providing this foundation for precision medicine and a better understanding of the rich diversity of African genetics so that the drugs and the medicines are better geared for the needs of Africans. Um, our challenge, collectively, and when we explore this afternoon, is how we can get around the table 
um, as foundations, as governments, as the private sector, and say, what can we all bring to this table and what can we all give up to, to, to build these, these networks together and to make that sort of generational uh, transfer of leadership so that Africa can set its own research priorities and so that foundations are investing in long-term capacity, not in programs that stop and then finish and then they're out again. Um, because that's, for me, is, is both the way that you have really effective scientific leadership to drive economic growth, but also how you have that flexible research capacity that can respond to epidemic threats. Thanks, uh, Ed. And that may be somewhat related to that. Let me uh, call on Nina Dudnik, who is the founder and CEO of Seedings Lab, uh, Seeding Labs, uh, which is a US-based nonprofit that invests in scientists. Um, and obviously, if you want to have research capacity, the most critical resource is the people to do the work. Absolutely. Um, and having been a scientist myself, actually, in Africa as well as in the United States, my answer to your question of what can public, private, and government sectors do together was very practical. Because the gap that I routinely see over and over again that I experienced firsthand myself is a, is a gap in a very fundamental market that scientists around the world in places like the US, the US where I was trained take for granted, which is access to the tools of science. You can have the most well-trained scientist in the world without the right tools to put her training to use, her hands are tied. Mm -hmm. And we have conducted surveys and collected uh, information for nine years now at Seeding Labs about the needs of scientists who are very well trained in many cases working here on the continent and around the world and what their needs actually are. And scientific equipment comes up over and over again as a fundamental part of the infrastructure that's actually missing. So to the, um, a, the most recent survey that we conducted last summer, scientists representing 12 countries in Africa, 76% of them said that their institution lacked sufficient equipment for them to do their current research, and 91% said it lacked the sufficient equipment to teach their students hands-on. And so our solution at Seeding Labs has been to derive a, and scale up a public-private partnership model to address this acute need for scientific equipment. And I think it's transferable throughout all of the different kinds of institutions that require this equipment, either clinical services and diagnostics, surveillance labs at the national level, QC labs testing medicines, we've uh, scaled it up within academia to provide now equipment worth over $15 million to scientists at 49 institutions in 28 countries around the world. 28 of those institutions are here in Africa. That's great. And this is a model that both provides, meets that acute need, puts the that ownership of the research agenda in the hands of scientists here in Africa, but also connects them via this sort of bridge of, of lab equipment to their counterparts in any other part of the world, so that now scientists, say, in Boston, who used to be using this equipment, can talk to their counterparts in Nairobi and connect via the equipment and now connect via the science and the healthcare needs. And yet you're empowering scientists to tackle problems that are important in Africa as opposed to problems that somebody else outside of Africa said exactly. they should work on, which exactly. is another important issue to address. Well, going uh, next to Muntaka Umar Sadiq, uh, who is the chief executive officer of something called the Private Sector Health Alliance of Nigeria and is also a World Economic Forum young global leader. Uh, with an interesting challenge here to try to put together various private sector resources and capabilities that would complement government's efforts. So maybe that's a representation of the different voices on this panel. You're somebody who tries to merge those together in Nigeria. Uh, How is that working and what do you see as the greatest need, uh, maybe looking at Nigeria in particular, uh, as far as an African-led health system that really works? Sure, first, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to share and give some color around uh, what we are trying to do as a basis to accelerate improvement in health outcomes through innovation and uh, partnerships. I think this discussion um, around an African-led health system is very timely and extremely relevant, particularly from a public and private sector perspective. Um, I think it is important to sort of speak about the theory of change and then talk about, okay, how we think um, the role of the private sector can influence health systems. I think first is that we know um, what the issues are, right? So we have a very complex, dynamic healthcare system in much of Africa, laden with both supply and demand side challenges, all right? And we know um, what the biggest issues are, suboptimal health outcomes, poor quality of care, both in public and private sector, and a lack of financial um, protection, right, as a result of the cost um, of care. 
Now, we also have mixed healthcare systems, right? So in Nigeria and in much, much of Africa, more Africans seek care in the private sector than public, right? So although um, the private sector accounts for over 60% of service provision, it is practically unengaged, right, till recently in terms of uh, health outcomes, right? And this is because of a number of market failures, everything from fragmentation to we don't necessarily have a coordinated private sector, right? It's, um, it's not uh, formally engaged and several other uh, market failures. But in addition, we also have a corporate private sector, right? So businesses like your financial institutions, your telcos, that have the capabilities, resources, and expertise that the health system can benefit from. By that, I mean um, supply chain capabilities of uh, Coca-Cola, for example, or your mobile health infrastructure of uh, Etisalat, right? But there wasn't any compelling platform pulling together all of these capabilities, techniques, to have impact at scale that is larger than underlying sort of corporate uh, contributions. And so our theory of change was really around creating this all-encompassing platform that pulls the innovative advances that we have in the private sector, the techniques, the money, the resources, um, and pull that together so that synergies in outcomes can begin to become a reality. So that coordinated, deliberate engagement with government to begin to look mm -hmm. at how do we advocate for the sort of fiscal policy required to unlock the market potential of the health sector, for example, or driving sort of a private sector-centric performance management te technique to strengthen health systems. So I think all of that um, was why um, the private sector health alliance was sort of set up and is led by business leaders in Nigeria, the likes of Alhaji Aliko Dangote, Mr. Jim Ovia, Mr. Aiki Mokwedi, and other business leaders who have sort of um, come together to offer um, this private sector techniques to support um, the health system. But to answer your question, I think we primarily focus on four things. And the first is really around innovation, because we understand that we need to identify, spur, and scale up promising innovations to leapfrog constraints, right? And the private sector is really positioned to sort of play that role. The second is really around partnerships, but by that we mean developing the synergies between the needs of the health system and the capabilities of the private sector, right? That neutral broker is required to ensure that the currency for health sector performance goes from inputs to outcomes, to <coughs> results, in terms of life safety, <coughs> right? And I think there are other aspects, particularly around impact investments, right? We're seeing increasing interest from our entrepreneurs, from our philanthropists, right, in engaging in social causes and mobilizing innovative financing to support the health system. So crowding all of these elements and making sure that we complement government efforts in achieving its universal health coverage agenda is at the heart of, uh, of what we do. That sounds very powerful, but challenging indeed to try to get all of those components to really work together. Uh, well, finally, at the far end of the panel, and then we're going to have uh, some additional interaction between the group, uh, this is Jürgen Brokatsky geiger who is Global Head Corporate Responsibility uh, for Novartis and who brings the private sector's perspective to this uh, from industry. And Novartis has been one of the companies that's been particularly invested, I think, in, in trying to see what could be done uh, in Africa. So what do you see as the opportunities, but maybe also the challenges that haven't been met yet that we could collectively try to figure out how to tackle? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And... Um... I'm very honored that I can sit on this panel and uh, represent my company. Um, a little bit afraid that I'm uh, w uh, the only big company who is sitting on the panel uh, when we have then the discussion. But um, I work in my company since uh, almost 35 years and I have been leading technical R&D for the company. I worked 10 years in HR as the global head of HR. And about three years ago, the chairman of the company, the CEO, came to us and said, how can we actually include corporate responsibility into the business to make it part of the business and not something which we do outside the business like, in, in, like we do it in our foundation, for example. And then I thought back um, when I started my work and when I was working in, in R&D, we worked on Coartem, which is our uh, malaria product, and actually... Uh, by chance, this uh, conversation here takes place in a, in a province where there was an epi epidemic in malaria at the time in, in 99 to 2003, and Coartem was there used actually first time to get rid of the epidemic. And as a consequence, then also policies have changed um, in, in th so that these kind of drugs could be used to treat malaria. So what did it need uh, for... Uh, uh, 
uh, improving for, for helping uh, uh, to patients to survive. It needed a drug. It needed government. It needed partnership to change um, the policies. And this shows that um, a pharmaceutical company can do something, but there are other parts in society with whom one needs to work together to come to a result. Now, only about two years ago, we had um, a similar discussion with our chairman and CEO, and the question was, what actually could we bring to the table? Where are our strengths? And then uh, not to be uh, engaged in things which we don't understand really, for example, like some supply chain uh, topics or some other topics where specialist companies are actually there who deal with uh, such subjects in an expert way. So we said our strength is drugs, our strength is capability building because we have many scientists in our organization who could be used to train scientists in African countries, for example. Mm -hmm. And also our strength is the business mind so that we could actually find out what kind of operational innovation could we do to reach patients which we would not reach today, like patients in rural areas, for example. And based on this, our company has started an endeavor, which um, is really an endeavor. It's uh, ongoing. Um, we have been launching about uh, two years ago in the presence of the First Lady of Kenya. Our chairman was doing this. We launched a portfolio of 15 different drugs to treat non-communicable diseases like hypertension, breast cancer, respiratory diseases, and diabetes. And we sell um, one package, one monthly package for one dollar. So that's an extremely low price. And we said, we can do this actually because we have a big generic arm in our, in our Novartis organization that produces billions of tablets to a low price. So that's our strength. And we, on the other side, said we, at the same time, we could do some capability building, some awareness building around the diseases, but we would need to partner, actually, with governments in uh, sub-Saharan African countries who would be willing to buy these products and then use it in their public clinics to a limited price of, let's say, $1.50, so that the poorest people could then afford the drugs, or the government would have something in hand which they can give to those people. So a partnership between government, between Novartis, and between NGOs, foundations, who could be partner in doing awareness building to prevent some of these um, non-communicable diseases, which becomes a big burden in, in many of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So we went away out of our comfort zone by um, not knowing actually if this model would work, but we said, okay, let's put our strengths on the table, let's have the discussion, and let's start this big experiment and see how it could work and um, how it could develop to make it even a little bit of profitable over time, in five years, in 10 years. And uh, we have launched in Kenya, we are on the way in, in some other countries, and we are in the middle of this big experiment. And, uh, interesting experiment to be sure. So we've talked about then quite a range of contributions uh, to efforts to, to address this issue about African-led health systems, all the way from research uh, to pills that are being delivered uh, at low cost and measurements of outcomes. How critical is it, anybody could tackle this, that the research efforts and the healthcare delivery efforts are connected together, maybe even within the same institutions, or is this something where both can be going forward as long as they're occasionally talking to each other and it, it's not so critical? Because that's clearly one of the issues that this conversation raises. Do they need to be uh, under the same roof? I'll have a quick go. So oh, go ahead. I, I, think, I think the important principle is that end-to-end -end coverage. So saying, look, you need to, to make a sort of research in former health system you do need access to basic discovery science, you know, the fundamental building blocks. And, and you do need those, the, those discoveries, the, the what comes out of that, to be drawn along the translational 
pipeline mm -hmm. and at, at, a, at the appropriate point, sort of connected to the clinical setting and then reiterated within the clinical setting. Um, I don't really care whether that's under a roof, a single roof or not, <laughs> but I think it's really important that you both have the space for the basic research and then that really focus on that iteration and implementation on the clinical side and, and putting it into practice. And just briefly to reflect, this is a real challenge for us in, in Welcome because we fund loads of basic research, particularly in the UK. We're also really committed to making sort of innovative, uh, innovative drugs and, and innovations happen and flourish. And, and for us, understanding that in end-to-end -end, um, sort of business and making each bit work in the right way so that you're not suffocating basic research by saying you've got to produce something tomorrow. And, and you're not sort of leaving stuff with an air gap between each one such that you have an amazing research paper that sits on a shelf for 50 years. Um, making all those bits join together is really hard. Um, but it's something that I think that's the way I'd approach this question of how to make the whole system work together. And the short answer is, of course, it has to. Yes. Anybody else want to disagree? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, perhaps I, I could build a bit on that. I think there are three things that I see that really hold all of this together. Mm. Um, I think the first is really around creating an ecosystem that links industry, the regulatory environment, and research and academia. That is important as we think about the fundamental uh, foundation which is around strengthening the health system. Mm -hmm. right? Now, in terms of the first pillar, which is really around the industry, right? so there are different context-specific opportunities in different countries. Some are looking uh, at you know, the research agenda around biotech and pharma. Um, and engaging the trade and investments to ensure that the right of living environments are there. Um, the second, in terms of academia, issues around both the production and, and, and comp competencies, but also on the regulatory side, is really around economic competitiveness and, and you know, business confidence as well. So there is a convergence platform that we need to begin to think about as we talk about in-country capacity for research mm -hmm. and innovation. Let me ask a minister, a Montreal lady, about the epidemiology that's leading us increasingly to appreciate uh, that in Africa, what has traditionally been primarily a concern about communicable diseases, which have certainly not gone away. We have lots of challenges still remaining there, but emerging more and more year by year is the non-communicable diseases as causes of morbidity and mortality, uh, such things as diabetes, cancer, <coughs> heart disease, uh, obesity, and so on. Uh, how does that factor into your trying to steer your healthcare system uh, to be effective in, in attacking the things that are going to be more and more frequent uh, as the time goes on. Are we in a good place uh, with non-communicable diseases to have the kind of training and expertise that one would want to have uh, to manage that part of the future <coughs> health of nations, including yours? We're not, and, and that's, <laughs> yes, we're not, definitely. And, and I like saying Africa cannot afford this coming explosion. Not coming, it's already there. Mm. Explosion of non-communicable diseases. Mm. Because that then becomes a double burden. We have not yet done away with communicable diseases. It's still a, a, a big battle. Sure. Now, if you add non-communicable disease to an ailing healthcare system, mm which still have to deal with malaria, huge pattern of TB, HIV, AIDS, that's, 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 you know, that's quite disastrous. Mm. So my, that's why I'm, I'm emphasizing on this issue of primary health care. Prevention, I'm, I'm saying that deliberately because I'm aware. In fact, the, 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 the research that we're talking about, if it can be in that direction, mm -hmm. can we research ways of preventing diseases even before they have, or even eradicating them, rather than just treating them as, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, th th that's very important for me. Now, fortunately, there are figures uh, by the WHO. I'm not sure why that booklet was not, you know, popularized around the world. Mm. When, when the, 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 the Sustainable Development Goal, the SDGs were adopted, the WHO released a booklet that actually shows in figures what I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, comparing on a scale to 100, communicable versus non-communicable disease. When you check that booklet, in the developing countries, it's 80-20. 80% yeah. 80 non-communicable diseases, 20% communicable diseases. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Africa, it's the other way. Mm -hmm. they, they switch over. 
Now, South Africa is in a very dangerous position. It was 53-47, which means we, already, we don't know whether we are Africa or we are Europe. We are already, <laughs> You're Africa, yes, trust me. Yes, and there were a few countries which are in that band. <laughs> South Africa is one of them, yeah. which means now we are having half Europe, half Africa, and we must deal with both of them at the same time. And that's why I'm talking about strengthening healthcare system, putting primary healthcare systems together mm -hmm. so that we do away with some of these things before they happen. But at the moment, it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite disturbing because how, how is Africa going to deal with it? We are, even to deal with communicable diseases, we are asking for donor funding a lot. Are we going to go to donors again to help us, to, to ask them to help us fight diabetes, cancer, Mm. high blood pressure, that, that's going to be very embarrassing. That's why also we need universal health coverage yeah. so that we are able to deal with it with own funding. That's why it's so important. So your points are very well taken. I'm curious to what extent there's a sharing uh, across Africa of these issues and particularly about best practices because I've certainly heard this uh, promotion of the idea that you could take health care delivery uh, experts, caregivers who have been maybe trained initially for a single disease, many of them uh, for HIV, and broaden their training so that they could become uh, community caregivers across the board. And I know some countries are trying to do that. I guess my question is, is there a sufficient amount of communication about those experiences between countries? So does Rwanda know what South Africa is doing? And does South Africa know what Rwanda is doing? Is there an opportunity there uh, for the whole continent uh, to become a laboratory uh, for trying out approaches and understanding what works and what doesn't? In fact, we have got no choice. <laughs> the, the first question, we have got no choice but to integrate. That's exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Gone are the days, because that's, that, that's what used to happen in South Africa. And the success was very low, mm -hmm. where you, 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 you treat diseases vertically. Even in the clinics, you train nurses like that. And you tell patients on Monday, it's TB, <laughs> right? This person come has got both TB and HIV and AIDS. He's been told that, no, today we deal with your TB. <laughs> then you must come on Wednesday <laughs> for your <laughs> HIV AIDS. But it so happened that the person also have got diabetes. <laughs> then your diabetes will see it on Friday. <laughs> How does a human being live like? And look, these are realities. These are not jokes. For instance... Mm -hmm. We, we know now in South Africa, uh, not, not only South Africa, but we know those figures here in South Africa. When people are HIV positive, their chances of contracting TB increases by 300%. Yes. If you are diabetic, your chances of contracting TB increase by 500%. So quite often you find a person who is HIV positive, has got TB, and is also diabetic. Then, then in the healthcare system, they, they must be taken care of on different days by different healthcare workers. Mm. They just simply don't come. One of the things that made us integrate HIV, AIDS, and TB very fast was simply that there was no success. People come for their HIV, AIDS, and they said, no, TB is in another clinic. You know, they just disappear forever, and they come back to die or when it's already worse. Mm. So that integration and even helping health workers is important. And health workers are resisting mm. because they were not trained like this. They actually believe it's torture. In other, and I was asking them, especially nurses in clinics, because they are fighting about this. They say it's inefficient because they were trained to specialize in what. Then mm. I said, but you want to us to design a healthcare system that is suitable for the health caregiver, not for the patient. The healthcare system must be designed for the patient, not for us. Mm. We must follow. Unfortunately, that, that needs a big change. A big change. Yes, and that's the change that we need to infuse. Jürgen. Yeah, thank you. I like this um, mentioning the, the prevention piece because that would be the best, actually. Then we wouldn't have to take um, any drugs in, in many cases. Um, let me share openly some of the issues which we see when we try to work with partners. Huh? I think what really works is partnership, for example, between my company and the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust. It's, it's a bilateral kind of partnership. Um, we have uh, common interests. As soon as there are two pharmaceutical companies talking to each other about a partnership, it becomes difficult, right, because there is competition. 
As soon as there are more than two partners there, it becomes difficult. As soon as there is now what we try to achieve for, for this Novartis Access portfolio, work with foundation NGOs, it becomes also difficult because the question often is, who gets the credit if it works? So even when we go there and say, look, um, that by chance we have these drugs, this is what we, what we bring to the table, would you, NGO, be willing, because it's your, your, your knowledge and your expertise, to do prevention uh, discussions and, 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 and education? And then the next question is, okay, do you pay us to do this? And I understand, because I believe this was the old model. Yeah? If we find a way to put the patient in the middle and said, what can these different parts of society do for the patient, and this is what we do, and this is what the others do, if we got to that status, that would be great. But there is a lot of uh, things in th which be speaks against it, huh? which is ecocentricity, it's whatever it might be. Well, that's been true for a long time. I do get a sense that there is some increased willingness to try to step outside it, of those traditional starting, yeah. competitive <laughs> barriers when they're actually getting in the way of our mission, which is to try to improve the health uh, of lots of people. So yeah. our experience is precisely that with both the CEPI, the, the new um, vehicle to create vaccines for epidemics, and also with Carbex, which is an accelerator trying to produce new antibiotics. Yeah. And we've worked with, uh, alongside others, BARDA in the US, Boston University, um, Gates and, and others, a number of countries on CEPI. And we managed to write in access with the pharma companies um, into the very early stage contracts for both accelerators and for Carbex on antibiotics. We've also managed to write in stewardship as a key principle, mm -hmm. recognizing that you don't, to solve AMR, you, you don't want to have too many antibiotics in the world, which is this really difficult market failure. And we've felt it is constructive, uh, and, and we have been able to align around those values. But as I say, it has been tough, because everyone's had to give up something. They have, and you need incentives, and altruism is a good one, but it may not always be sufficient, yeah. so sometimes it helps to have some money involved. And yeah. as the NIH director, I've often said, when you run into a resistant circumstance where people say, oh, you'll never get that to happen because that's like herding cats, uh, my response is, okay, I know how to herd cats, you just move their food. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, NIH and the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust have some food, and we yep. try, try to use it wisely in that regard. I, I am curious, though, about this idea of sharing best practices across countries. There, again, that's something that where a lot could be gained, but there may be competitive reasons why that's not so easy. I don't know, Muntaka, whether this is something, you're pursuing this interesting model in Nigeria. Are, are other countries aware of what you're doing? Do you have other people that you talk to who are trying similar things in other parts of West or, or East or South Africa? And, and is, is there something there we could do a bit better? Yeah, so I think that um, the way to think about it is that every single country, right, has a context-specific issue, mm -hmm. but collectively we're all trying to achieve the same thing. We're trying to save lives. We're trying to, we're at different phases of achieving universal health coverage to your question around communicable versus non-communicable diseases. I mean, in Nigeria, for example, four-fifth of the disease burden is communicable diseases, right? Mm -hmm. And one-fifth, roughly, is non-communicable diseases. And the Honorable Minister is right. It is a hidden time bomb because on the NCD space, it is rising rapidly. Yeah. And there's an underlying issue with data, right? Where, and, and this is very consistent across the continent, where no one is really sure for TB, for cancers, where are we with prevalence rates, so, so that is a big issue, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, there are, there are roles for government and that for the private sector. So if you think about non uh, diseases, we all know they're driven by lifestyle, you know, aging population, lifestyle issues. And so the health promotion and prevention on the one side, but also early diagnosis, right? It's screening, early diagnosis, all incredibly important. But the role of government in terms of a tobacco, the risk factors, a tobacco control bill, mental health bill, right? These are, these are themes that call for the sorts of collaborations required. Um, Nigeria has tested this model of kind of engaging the government, particularly on the demand side, the promotion piece, the screening uh, aspect, tackling data issues, but also the role of government in being stewards, right, and enhancing uh, regulation around certain kinds of bills that would have impact at scale, particularly around some of the targeted um, risk uh, factors. But as we speak about all of this, fundamentally, it's about strengthening health systems, right? To ensure we have increase in coverage. That's, what it, that's sort of what, what it's about. But also as we do that, ensuring that we are integrating vertical programs at the front line. 
Makes sense. I'm going to bring you all into this conversation in just a moment. I want to ask Nina one quick question and then we'll open it up. Uh, Nina, I'm curious in terms of the way in which you make decisions about who to support uh, through seeding labs. There's been a sense that much of the research that is funded by outside funding agencies like NIH or Welcome or, or even the Gates might not necessarily be exactly the projects that the African scientists themselves <laughs> would have said were most relevant and most worth mm -hmm. pursuing. Uh, but I gather you are, in some ways, putting them in the driver's seat about that. Do you see that that changes the spectrum of projects that you're asked to support compared to what you might say you would find in the NIH portfolio of global health research, just to name an example? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, the answer is partially. So we, get, we are research topic agnostic at Seeding Labs, um, in very large part because we want scientists to drive those priorities themselves. Mm -hmm. And we can see by the way that they explain the projects that they're working on, that these are really being derived from a frontline perspective on what the problems are in the communities around them, but also a very strong awareness of what problems exist around the world. Mm -hmm. And so we see, if it's a Venn diagram, there is some overlap. Um, and so we certainly get proposals from scientists who are working on TB and HIV and malaria, as well as non-communicable diseases. Uh -huh. We're supporting two research groups who are working on molecular biomarkers for, in oncology in Africa, for example. Um, we're also supporting a number of research groups that are working on antibiotic resistance across Africa, yeah. including a scientist here in Durban who's just filed a patent on a metallobetalactamase, mm. which is mm. something that is kind of the holy grail in antibiotic yeah. resistance. And so I think that there's this entire spectrum from projects that would go overlooked up through projects that have absolutely global scale relevance. Mm -hmm. And the scientists themselves are very aware of how these priorities fit locally and globally. That's nice, and that might be a snapshot. If we can succeed in getting this CARI effort off the ground, mm -hmm. what might be more the spectrum of science that would be supported, which might be a little different than what currently happens. I mean, that's part of the goal, is to put Africa in the center. Well, let me uh, open this up, and uh, if you would, ask questions that are fairly brief, not speeches, and uh, if you want to direct it to one member of the panel, that's fine, uh, otherwise we'll figure it out. So let me start here in the front row, and the microphone's coming to you. Maybe identify yourself, if you would. Great, thank you very much. My name is Malusi Peza. I work for Gilead Sciences, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, just to be very brief, uh, first of all, I would like to compliment uh, our Honorable Minister um, Mutsuledi, just not just speaking around uh, prioritizing prevention, but we've seen a very tactical, objective matter on prevention through PrEP. Um, which takes me to just raising a second point around collaboration with pharmaceutical companies. Um, the DREAMS project, uh, which still speaks to the subject of PrEP, has been a phenomenal um, example of how various uh, multinational um, pharmaceutical organizations partner, Aviv, Johnson & Johnson, Gilead, um, within the PEP first structure, etc. And then it brings me to my specific question uh, for which I've uh, specifically come to this platform. Um, both for South Africa and both uh, for Nigeria, um, is that when you look at the top of the pyramid, um, patients are essentially funded through multinational corporations in a Nigerian setting in South Africa. There's a huge private sector funding um, that we have that covers the, that's basically the majority or holds the largest weight of our GDP healthcare expenditure. The base of the pyramid is largely catered for through um, donor funding, uh, tax base income, etc. Uh, what solutions do we have for individuals who are essentially middle income, highly economically productive, who don't necessarily have coverage, uh, for example, for diseases like viral hepatitis B, viral hepatitis C, even access to PrEP, uh, where we do have individuals, especially platforms like this, for example, the Mutsepe Foundations, and in, in Nigeria, there's uh, various oil-based wealth mechanisms that exist to create microfinancing solutions for these individuals that have minimal uh, disposable income capacity, but are willing to contribute mm. income uh, to this. Minister, I think that sounds like maybe you should take a crack at that. <laughs> At least that was my assumption from what he said. 
Where, what do we do about the middle income folks and how do they get covered? Hey, well, uh, that's a very difficult one because I think it, it assumes that we want to solve the problem from in, in, in a way that the present healthcare system has been fashioned. Mm. Yes, mm. And, and I thought universal health coverage specifically was designed to abolish that. There you go. Yes, that, that will be my <laughs> first prize because I don't want to put anything between. It was, it was done to do that and that's why uh, the, the, the Director General of the World Health Organization, uh, Dr. Margaret Chan, said it's an equalizer between the rich and the poor. The faster we move to that equalizer, the better. I mean, look, look at the situation in South Africa. It's very crazy. I'm sorry to use that word. We, according to the World Health Organization, if a country spends 5% of its GDP on health, it's supposed to have better health outcomes. In South Africa, we're already at 8.5%. We're spending 8.5% of the GDP on health. It's no different from Europe. I think an average European country is at 9%. Mm -hmm. So we are more or less there in terms of expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Mm -hmm. But we have got the worst health outcomes. Very bad. In, in fact, we are the worst in BRICS. And why am I mentioning BRICS? Because the countries in BRICS are still far from reaching even that 5%. I know Russia... The last time I checked was at 4.5% of the GDP. Hmm. China is at 4.6%. India is still at 4.2%. But they've got better health outcomes. It's only Brazil that is at 9%. Hmm. But they all have better health outcomes. Now the question I'm being asked, where is the money going to? <laughs> Why are you spending so much money that you have got poor health outcomes? And the answer is very obvious and simple. Hmm. It's because 4.4% of that 8.5 goes to only 16% of the population. Mm -hmm. The remaining 4.1% goes to 84% of the population. That is gross inequality on a scale that is unimaginable in any part of the world. Now, if you put all that money together and save the population together in a form of universal health coverage, then you'll discover that actually we don't need a lot of extra money. It's already there. Mm. but mal distributed. It's not reaching people who it ought to be reaching. And, and that's why, for us, the issue of universal health coverage in South Africa mm. is a matter of life and death as far as I'm concerned. And that would take care of the middle-income people, yes, too. It's it not just the rich and the poor, it's everything in between. Yes. And, and just to <laughs> add to that, this 16% of the population in South Africa is the cream of the nation. It's like taking everybody who is people who have got names and addresses and titles, put them in one corner with your rich resources and leave the rest of the population behind because mm -hmm. that's what it is. The 16% I'm talking about are people who are insured. It's your teachers, your nurses, your judges, your members of parliament, mm -hmm. anybody who earns a salary and has got some form of a title. Then the rest you throw them away, but they constitute 84%. And what does industry do? When industry wants labor, they go to those same people who are dying because they are not covered. Mm. How is the economy going to grow? It simply won't grow. It will remain stagnant because it's unproductive. You make a great case. Uh, right here in the second row, yes. Um, good evening. My name is Peter Sullivan. I was newspaper editor. Um, I hate to say this, but a lot of our problems are caused by sex. <laughs> and there are a great many politicians who keep saying we need to change the sexual behavior of, uh, of the people in order to prevent HIV, I suppose. But the reality is in South Africa, we have very little idea of what that sexual behavior is. We have never had any kind of data on what, us, what the sexual behavior of South Africans is. If you look at the Kinsey report, it really changed the way Americans saw sex, in my opinion. And I think um, as much as we keep telling the youth to change their sexual behavior, none of us know what that behavior is from Kaya Leacher to Nkandla to Johannesburg to anywhere else in South Africa. And I think instead of simply saying, please change your behavior, we should have 
a proper survey that looks at what the sexual behavior is of South Africans <coughs> because we don't know what it is. We only know it anecdotally. It would cost quite a lot of money, but I think that that would, the, the kind of publicity that that would get would help us to make the youth aware of how much sexual behavior needs to change. Well, I, I knew we were going to have a broad-ranging discussion, but I didn't <laughs> imagine that we'd come to this. But here, here it is. It's on the table. So, uh, yes. <laughs> you, yeah, you want to come? Uh, uh, yes, I'm, so, I'm sure it's coming to me rather. Yes. <laughs> Unless they would like to yes. jump in. No, no, that, that's not our approach now. <coughs> the, the fact of the matter is there are a few facts that we know. Number one, we, we have turned the corner on HIV and AIDS. I'm sure everybody around the world knows that. We have turned the corner. For instance, back in 2004, we used to have 70,000 babies in South Africa born HIV positive every year. Today, the figure is less than 6,000 from 70,000. I'm mentioning it in raw figures, not percentages <coughs> for you to understand the extent. That's because of PMTCT, Prevention of Mother-Child Transmission. Maternal mortality has dramatically dropped because 50% of maternal mortality was HIV and AIDS. But we, when we sit down and take stock, we found that we have achieved that because of biomedical intervention. Where we are failing, not only in South Africa, there's been a study done in 14 Southern and Eastern African countries and found that on socio-behavioral interventions, we have found one thing. In those countries, 14 of them, there are 5,000 new infections per week in girls between the ages of 14 and 24, girls and young women between the ages of 15 years to 24. And it's because of the failure of <coughs> social behavioral <coughs> interventions. So our, our approach was not rese to research se sexual behavior. This is what we did. We launched a project. It was launched by the deputy president on the 24th of June. It's called She Conquers. I'm, I'm a, along the American Dreams program, mm -hmm. by the way, that's funded mm -hmm. by PEPFA. Mm -hmm. It's called She Conquers, and it was named by a, a young girl when we, we, we staged in a form of a competition, give it a name. We used to say it's a whole society, whole government program. There are five objectives. Can you reduce the rate of HIV and AIDS in that age group? Mm -hmm. That's objective one. Can you reduce the, a, the, the incidence of teenage pregnancy? which is also very prevalent amongst them. That's objective mm -hmm. two. Can you reduce the incidence of gender-based violence? Because that's also the driver of HIV and AIDS on the African continent. Four, can you keep them at school mm -hmm. for as long as possible, at least up to metric? Because they are a bit safer when they are at school than when they are out of school. Mm -hmm. And number five, can you link them to skills and economic opportunities so as to reduce their dependence from a group of men whose, whose name I even hate to mention. They are called blessers or sugar daddies, you know. Mm -hmm. People who have got money, men, very old men who have got money, but prepare to sleep with young girls because they, they, they give them money for mm -hmm. airtime, for, you know, a whole mm -hmm. lot of things. Now, in South Africa, they've called them blessers. Can we wind them away from these blessers by making them independent? Now, when we do that, we are going to profile the girls one by one. Instead of saying, what is the sexual behavior of South Africans? We are going to say, what is the sexual behavior of this one young girl? In terms of, you know, her socialization, her home circumstances, her family. Yes, this particular one, can we offer her prep? Because from the profile we get, it's just a matter of time for her to get to be HIV positive or to fall pregnant. The other one, can we offer her post-exposure prophylaxis? This one, can we offer her condoms? That other one, can we actually link her parents to some form of parenting groups? Because when you profile her, you realize that the parents have got no clue how to take care of an adolescent. So that's our new approach. I don't know whether it will eventually show the sexual behavior, but it will tell us what to do with any one individual. And I'm specifically concentrating on girls because I'm sure you are aware why. The rate of infection in that age group of girls 
is four times, sometimes even up to eight times, yes. than boys in the same age group. So they are the ones who are attacked. Exactly. No, that's, that, I'm glad to hear you're doing that. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions because we were warned we had to be out of here precisely at 6 o'clock. Yes, please. Yeah, first of all, let me just uh, thank the expert panel for uh, very well articulated thoughts about the issues as well as the solutions. Um, one theme I heard recurrently is public-private partnerships. And I think, um, uh, I think it was uh, Umar who actually even segmented that further into corporate uh, private sector, I would say. So my question for you is, is, as a part of Big Farmer, we want to be a part of a solution. And oftentimes, you know, people think about us uh, in terms of just selling. But I'm, I'm here to say that as a, as a representative of Big Farmer, we're not only interested in selling, we're very heavily committed and interested in health outcomes, disease burden reduction, and actually have an impact. But when we've tried to do that, you know, oftentimes we uh, were perceived as having a conflict of interest. So my question is to Honorable Minister uh, of, of, of Health of South Africa, what can we do? How can we better engage to diffuse that tension around this perceived conflict of interest? Because as I said, we do want to be a part of a solution. <coughs> Thank you. And which company are you from, just so that we know to sign you up for the Coalition for Advancing <laughs> Research and Innovation? All right, we got that. Mark Schopendow, Mr. Thank you. Well, Minister. if you are talking about the event that took place here in South Africa, was it 2013? It's not me, it's you. Big Pharma, who started. All we were doing was, which civil society, by the way, has asked us, can we look, can we re look at the IP, the intellectual property, because the 20 years of the, w, the WTO of giving a patent is about to come to an end. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, patents are given for 20 years. And you know that there was this problem of evergreening, where companies, uh, I'm not blaming anybody, but we're told that there's evergreening. Whenever the 20 years is about to come to an end for generic to be produced, they just tweak the molecule and it becomes a new drug. They start another 20 years. And that worries us because let me tell you, my dear, there's no Africa will, West Africa will survive without generics. It's not going to happen. At the moment, 80% of the ARVs that we, we acquire here in Africa are all generics from, from countries like India, for instance. Mm. So when we wanted to tweak and say, let's have an intellectual property regime that suits our continent, then there was a fight with Big Pharma and they believe we are enemies. I'm still a very big friend of Big Pharma, <laughs> by the way, and I'm prepared to sit with them and talk. That's Definitely, great. because without Big Pharma, we'll be gone. But, but please understand, the intellectual property must be in such a way that it helps people. Maybe, th maybe there's a solution, because the Secretary General of the United Nations put together the Director General of WTO, the Director General of the World Property, Intellectual Property uh, 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 Organization and the Director General of World Organization to sit together to strike a balance right. between this. And if that balance is struck, then it's a win-win situation. I will be happy. But I want to emphasize I'm no enemy of Big Pharma. <laughs> Big Pharma created themselves in an, into an enemy. I don't know why. <laughs> yes. Ed, do you want... Oh, sorry, Nina. Nina. I, yeah, I'd love to... We should talk because Merck uh, Research Labs has worked with us for a number of years on a very high level. I, two, uh, two ideas Im immediately come in. One is related to intellectual property, but the first is to actually engage in projects that genuinely respond to and meet the needs of people on the ground. So from a scientific research perspective, that's meeting the actual real declared needs of scientists, which can be done through programs like ours, for example, in a way that's also strategically linked to your business. Right, because fundamentally, everyone is trying to solve the same problems, right? the same diseases. And your scientists need a perspective from the scientists on the ground. They need research equipment. They need expertise from your scientists. And ultimately, right, these are only going to be solved through collaboration. And that's strategically valuable for everybody. It's a real, when it's done as a real, genuine collaboration, mm -hmm. not sort of parachute science, but genuine collaboration together, where everybody is equ has equitable collaborative stakes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Understood. Absolutely. Well, I know the people who organize these sessions at the World Economic Forum want the moderator to give an elegant summary of what's just happened. <laughs> given, given the fact it's precisely 6 o'clock and I have no idea how to summarize a topic as broad as this, I'm simply going to say this has been a really interesting discussion and please thank our panel.